Welcome to the presentation of our work on the computational design and optimization of quad meshes based on diagonal meshes. I'm Helmut Potman presenting the geometry part, and then I'm going to hand over to Eike Schling, who will discuss the architectural application. Our work is motivated by the importance of quadrilateral structures in architecture. On the top, we see a fully discrete structure from planar quad panels. Below is a quad structure from smooth element. Nodes in the latter case are easy to understand and angles well defined. Here we have a node where elements meet at the right angle. Above is a discrete version of a right angled node, but expressing that is not straightforward. Angles between neighboring edges or beams are different. Various solutions for dealing with angles in discrete structures have been proposed. Today, we propose a very simple solution, which we call the checkerboard approach. We first talk about controlling angles at planar quad meshes, then turn to angles at discrete asymptotic nets, and finally, Eike will talk about the practical implementation as asymptotic grid shells. We start with a very simple geometric fact. Given a quadrilateral in space, we connect its edge midpoints and yield a parallelogram. The edges of the parallelogram are parallel to the diagonals of the quad, and they have half of their length. Applying this to a quad mesh, we get the checkerboard pattern of parallelograms. Several meshes play a role here. The original quad mesh shown in yellow, we call it the control mesh, but it is not the target of design. Target of design are the following three meshes. The checkerboard pattern of parallelograms, and the two diagonal meshes of the control mesh, shown here in blue and red. Angles are simply measured between diagonals in the faces of the control mesh. Together with mesh fairness, this is a simple way to control angles in quad meshes. Note that a white face in the checkerboard pattern is a scaled version of a face in one of the two diagonal meshes. Therefore, we obtain planar quads in a checkerboard pattern if both diagonal meshes have planar quads. The parallelograms are, of course, planar anyway. So this gives in total three planar quad meshes, the checkerboard pattern and the two diagonal meshes. The checkerboard pattern may lack a little bit in fairness as shown here, but with appropriate fairness terms, the diagonal meshes do not suffer from fairness. How do we get nearly rectangular panels? Classically, there are two approaches, a circular mesh or a conical mesh. Finding these discrete versions for right angles is not straightforward. However, in the checkerboard approach, it is straightforward. We simply go for orthogonal diagonals. We arrive here at new types of principal meshes. In fact, we get three mesh meshes with nearly rectangular faces. The checkerboard pattern, which now has black rectangles and white planar quads, and the two diagonal meshes. Every surface can be approximated by such a principal mesh, simply because it is a discrete version of an always existing principal curvature parameterization. What about support structures? For that, we define discrete normals at the vertices of a diagonal mesh, here the red one, as being orthogonal to the corresponding quad in the other mesh, here the blue one. Neighboring discrete normals are coplanar. This is easy to see. And it is useful for support structures in architectural applications. There, we just use the discrete normals as node axes. And now we have neighboring node axes, which are coplanar. So we end up with a torsion-free support structure for both of the two diagonal meshes. Of course, we'll only use one in a practical application. The actual computation is based on numerical optimization. We use the discrete normals as auxiliary variables to express planarity. The corresponding term in the numerical optimization has as first part this one, where we express that the normals are orthogonal to all edges of the corresponding face in the diagonal mesh. The second term normalizes these normals. It takes care of avoiding that these normals tend to zero vectors, in which case the first term would not express planarity. 
The term for angle constraint is totally straightforward. We just write down the known formula for computing an angle between two vectors. Here, of course, are diagonal vectors in a control graph. Note that constant angles are easily expressed, not just the right angles. To achieve black rhombuses in the pattern, we have to make sure that diagonals in a control graph have equal lengths, and the formulation in mathematics is forward. This result shows patterns from planar quads, planar white quads, and uh, dark blue here, squares. This is a shape restriction, actually, and represents so-called isothermic surface. Here, an architectural situation. This example shows a planar quad mesh with 60 degree angle, again 60 degree, but here the black faces are rhombuses. We can rationalize any shape with a planar quad mesh of constant angle with some limitations for positive Gaussian curvature, but for details we refer here to the paper. Let us now move to the second type of structures, namely asymptotic grid shells. They are built from flat straight strips of material arranged in a grid and brought into the final shape by elastic deformation. In the final design, strips are orthogonal to a smooth surface, which is not materialized. The advantages of this profile orientation is that the strong axis is placed so that the structure is resilient against normal loads, and the weak axis implies that low bending stiffness for the erection process. Here an example in front of a building at the Technical University of Munich. Let us look at the geometry. Differential geometry tells us that the flexible straight strip, which is just subject to bending but not to stretching, can be attached orthogonally to a base surface only along an asymptotic curve. Such a curve follows directions of vanishing normal curvature, which requires a negatively curved surface. If we have right angles, we have orthogonal asymptotic curve, which characterizes minimal surfaces. A discrete model is given by quad meshes with planar vertex stars, meaning that the four edges that emanate from a vertex lie in a common plane. In the checkerboard approach, we make sure that both diagonal meshes have planar vertex stars. And we express this, of course, with normals as auxiliary variables very much as before for the planar quad meshes. So finally, we arrive at a nonlinear least squares problem where the objective function is composed of various terms. The first one takes care of the angle measurements, the second of length in diagonals. The third is the term for planar quads, the fourth for the A nets, and the fifth deals with fairness, which I didn't discuss here, but we refer to the paper. Please note that we will never optimize for planar quads and planar vertex stars at the same time, so either lambda 3 or lambda 4 will be zero here. We use a Levenberg market algorithm for numerical solution. Here we show an example of an A net with a right angle which is, of course, then a minimal surface. We also see here the checkerboard pattern. And here we just have a visualization as a grid shell from one of the two diagonal meshes. And let me know, now hand over to Eike. Thank you, Helmut. Now I would like to talk about the possibilities of such constrained quadrilateral meshes for architectural design and construction. We realized early on that we can use asymptotic networks to construct elastic grid shells from lamellas that are initially flat and straight. This has benefits for the fabrication process. It allows for an efficient use of sheet material and repetitive joint details. If we opt for constant 90 degree joints, we can design negatively curved grid shells on minimal surfaces. This is simple for a small, tabletop model like this. However, when we up the scale to approximately four by four meters, like in this timber prototype, we have to adapt the construction to successfully resist the larger loads. Here, the lamellas are constructed on two levels and connected by square timber studs. We chose to use two parallel lamellas for each direction to resist local buckling under compression. 
The lamellas of this timber prototype were fabricated by hand using only a table saw. As a next step, we developed a series of orthogonal joints for large scale steel construction. A is a reciprocal angulated joint. B is a double layer joint similar to the timber prototype we just saw. C and D offer an interlaced construction of lamellas, either with one or two parallel lamellas. This allows for a neat construction in one level, but it creates slots at every intersection, which weaken the profiles. Our latest development is a composite system in which we prefabricate the double lamella sheets with rubber inlays to prevent kinking or buckling at the joint. The rubber also acts as a cartilage and bone connection at the joints. This allows for approximately 30 degree rotation during assembly. With this kind of joint, we can first assemble the lamellas flat. The joints are now not all 90 degrees. And then deform the complete segment into the designated design shape. The star connector fixes each joint at 90 degrees but it also allows a continuous elastic curvature of the lamellas. So far, we've only looked at constant 90 degree nodes, but the design can be extended to any angular constraint, which extends the design spectrum from only minimal surfaces to all surfaces with a constant ratio of principal curvatures, K1 over K2. We tried to embrace the dynamic nature of these diamonds to design an urban metro station, including elevated facade. This grid gel could be constructed with repetitive cast steel iron joints. However, the lamellas in between the joints have to accommodate the geodesic curvature and torsion. Finally, I would like to talk about controlling the intersection angles as a design parameter. This example shows a quad grid with a transition from 60 to 90 degree angles. Now we can reverse this transition from 90 to 60 degree and this shows how we can control the design shape, the opening and the elongation of the design surface, simply by controlling the angles of the quadrilateral asymptotic grid. We use a similar strategy in the design of the canopy for the Intergroup Hotel in Ingolstadt. In this design, we combine four modular grids to create a cantilever and gate entrance to the design hotel. Each module was fabricated flat and then pulled up at one end to create an inverted hanging grid shell. This funicular construction process created a transition of angles from 90 degree at the base to approximately 60 at the top. Once this design shape was found, each module was fixed by adding steel boundaries and welding each joint. The four modules were then combined on site and covered with a lightweight membrane roof. Here you can see my family on a site visit. The transition of angles from 60 degree to 90 degree was an important design feature and beneficial for the load bearing behavior because it created a more direct flow of forces towards the supports. So controlling the angles inside a quad mesh lets us design a transformable structure. This is an effect that we are very excited about. Our latest project is looking at a large scale elastic grid mechanism. The kinetic umbrella is currently under construction and will hopefully be completed in July. The elastic mechanism is controlled through vertical and horizontal cables which shift the angles of the quad 
in the top row from 0 degrees to 30 to 60 and 90 degrees. The angles at the base remain constant. This causes a transformation from a cylindrical tower into a funnel-shaped umbrella. To facilitate the sort of movement, we developed a new eccentric joint. We use extruded aluminium profiles to connect two glass fiber lamellas with a single vertical bolt. This way we can ensure optimal rotation and the continuity of the bending stiffness. I would like to end our presentation with this project as a meeting point of geometry and mechanics. This image beautifully shows how the internal stresses and gravity influence the kinetic behavior. The minimum energy state of equilibrium is shown in the middle, and this can be actuated to close the structure on the left or to open the umbrella on the right. My colleague and engineer Jonas Shikura has presented our insights on kinetics of such semi-compliant mechanisms in a separate paper on this conference. Thank you for your attention.